This afternoon's big search for 13-year-old Philip Kearns was a community's response to his disappearance. However, despite the hundreds of hours that have gone into the search so far over the past 17 days, the Gardaí are still baffled by his disappearance. This is the case of Philip Kearns, who disappeared after leaving his home on the 23rd of October 1986. 13-year-old Philip left his home in Ballyroan, Rathfarnham, Dublin at 1.30pm to go back to school after he came home for lunch. He would never be seen again. Over 34 years later, his disappearance has not yet been solved. Philip had just started at Colosta Enna Secondary School the previous September and he settled in well. He had four older sisters and one younger brother. It was a busy house in a middle class area. His mother Alice was a homemaker and his dad Philip Sr. worked for the company Nestle. The family were a religious family, as were many a family in the 80s. And since Philip had just made his confirmation the previous May, he too had followed in the rest of the family's faith. This deep faith would stand to them all in the years to come, as they searched for answers as to what happened to Philip. Philip was quiet, shy and well behaved. He loved football, hurling and angling, and had spent the weekend before he went missing with his father fishing in Wexford and asked his father to go out again the following weekend, but this was not to be. When Philip arrived home that Thursday, Alice, his mother, said there was nothing unusual with Philip. He had his sandwich and caught up on homework for classes he had that afternoon. The Cairns' home was just a 15-minute walk to the school, and it was a regular thing that Philip would come home at lunchtime. When he was leaving the house, he shouted goodbye to his grandmother, who lived with them most of the time, but nobody saw him leave. Alice would later say she heard the front door shut when he left. Philip was to meet his friend at his house and they were to walk back to school together. But Philip never showed and never made it back to the school that day. While the teachers thought he had a family emergency or something, they never inquired of his whereabouts and the family, meanwhile, thought he was in school. So it wasn't until 5.30 p.m., when Philip Sr. got home, he saw that Philip wasn't there. Philip Sr. was not overly worried, as he thought that since Philip started secondary school, he was making new friends and was probably out with them. He was pleased at the prospect of this, as Philip tended to be shy. But when Alice returned home from the dentist with her daughter, she was not pleased, as it was well dark by now and it would have been unusual for Philip not to come home after school. The Cairns contacted the school and learned that Philip had not returned to school after lunch. It was then the family realised something was wrong and so they proceeded to ring Philip's friends and call to neighbours looking for him. They drove the route Philip would have taken to the school but there was no sign of him anywhere. Gardy was also contacted and they reacted straight away and put out a search team. But they were five hours behind already as they were only notified at 7pm. The Garda search started in earnest the next morning and their first port of call was the Cairns home to reassure them that everything was being done to find Philip. The normal 48 hour wait was put aside as the weather was so bad and it was totally out of character for Philip not to come home. The friend that Philip was due to meet that lunchtime was away that weekend with the scouts and the possibility that Philip went with him was explored but to no avail. Over the weekend, two prayer vigils were held at the local church in Rothfarnham and Philip's parents thanked family, friends and strangers for attending. A description was issued by the Gardaí and it was printed in all the newspapers. By the following Tuesday, the Gardaí were searching Rothfarnham, going through lakes, riverways, parks and fields. Teams of search dogs were brought in as well as locals, civil defence and special search teams from the Garda Síochána. Philip's classmates were called back from their midterm break to do interviews. Teachers were also interviewed and they reported that Philip was in good form that day. It was now six days in on the search and still no sign of him. Philip's father at this stage said in interviews to the media that he felt Philip had been kidnapped either through trickery or coercion. Gardy felt differently as they had come across no evidence of foul play and no witnesses had come forward from the day of him going missing, saying they saw anything suspicious. 
Alice also went on TV to appeal for her son to come home. Yes, I know that your husband would have <coughs> wished to do this interview with us, but he isn't feeling the best at the moment. Well, it's a bit of a strain on him because he's, like, whereas I'm in the house and people are coming in and coming, he's going out and searching all the time and that's, you know, very traumatic for him. Well, what have you got to say to those people who are looking at this program at the moment, tell us? Well, um, if they're holding Philip, I think, you know, they have nothing to fear from us. <laughs> As a family, you know, we forgive them completely for anything that they have done. And we just want to see Philip back and we pray for the, for the return of Philip. Everybody's been praying for it. All we're concerned with is Philip or where would he be? On the 30th of October, traffic stops were set up on the Ballyroan Road outside both Karen's house and the school. They were hoping that someone may have been passing by that day and may have seen something. A diviner was also contacted by the family, but again no answers. Also on this day, it was reported in the newspaper that Philip's school bag was found by two girls at 8pm when they were passing through a laneway around half a mile from his home. They went to the local Garda station straight away after they looked in it and saw Philip's name on his books. The next day, it was reported that when the bag was found, it was not wet, even though there had been heavy rain throughout the day. It was also on a road that Philip would not have taken. Books were missing from the bag, which were both religious. The laneway was described as a cement path between block walls, separating semi-detached houses. In one breath, the guardies said they thoroughly searched the area over the previous days. And in another breath, they said it was possible they missed it. One of the girls that found the bag said she had passed through the lane numerous times that day and didn't see the bag until that evening. It was stated that the guardy think that the school bag may have been thrown into the lane in which it was found. It was suggested that the bag was found elsewhere and whoever found it panicked and sought to dispose of it. On the 2nd of November, hopes were starting to fade for Philip's return. Gardaí were investigating possibilities of bullying in school and rumours of possible sinister religious ceremonies in the fields near Philip's house. But by the 4th of November, Gardaí were putting these possibilities as a low priority. At this stage also, it is revealed that Philip had £40 in his savings that had not been touched. By the 6th of November, the Kearns family had received a series of silent, heavy breathing phone calls and even a very distressing phone call with a child sobbing in the background. Some people are just sick. On November 7th, 1986, Gardaí were investigating the death of 26-year-old Brendan Houlihan, who was found in the Royal Canal in Dublin, in his underwear and vest, with part of his shirt stuffed into his mouth. Shortly before Mr. Houlihan went missing on the 5th of November, the priest at the church had said Mr. Houlihan had been checking out the register to find out Philip's date of baptism, and he also had been a sacristan at the church. This church was St. Columba's Church in Glasnevin. The Cairns family and the Houlihans lived close to the church. Brendan lived with his parents and was said to be quiet and shy. The Cairns family moved away to Rathfarnham in 1978. Of course, I had to investigate this man's death. It turns out that Mr. Houlihan had been out on his bike the night he went missing, delivering letters on behalf of Monsignor Feely. He was accosted by two brothers, John and Declan Kenna, robbed, beaten, stripped, gagged and thrown into the canal. Of course, again, justice was not done in this case as per usual. John Kenner received 10 years for manslaughter and Declan received three years for robbery. I think Brendan recognised Philip's name and out of curiosity, he simply looked up his baptism. By the 10th of November, a giant search by Gardaí and the public took place in the Dublin mountains, but nothing is found except for a set of keys and clothing, later identified as belonging to a jogger. A week later, the Gardaí conduct another search, but nothing is found. By November 25th, the investigation was scaled down to just 12 detectives and on the 27th of November, it was reported that hoax calls to the Cairns family continued. In December, a pre-Christmas appeal was made and flyers were handed out once again. Gardaí continued their house-to-house -house inquiries. 
It was still deemed a missing person case and had not been upgraded to a kidnapping or murder. By Christmas, a thousand statements had been taken and hundreds of calls had been received and Philip's details had been sent to Interpol and given to 138 countries, but no new leads were discovered. By Philip's 14th birthday in September 1987, there were still no new leads either. The family celebrated by holding a special mass. As his first anniversary came round, the Gardaí stepped up the investigation, investigating individuals known to belong to various religious groups. In 1989, an investigating journalist concluded that Philip was offered and accepted a lift back to school by an adult male close to him whom he knew and respected. The adult male drove him to the school, but did not stop there. The man was said to work and live locally. He was not a sex offender. He was almost certainly interviewed by Gardy. It was said the removal of the religious books from Philip's school bag was a deliberate ploy to steer Gardy towards a sect or cult. In the autumn of 1989, Gardy received four phone calls where one of the people gave specific details about the aftermath of Philip's disappearance and had named two people in connection with his disappearance. The Gardy made it public after not hearing back from this person. The Gardaí took these calls seriously and appealed for the man to get back in contact with them in the strictest of confidence. They also said a hoax could not be ruled out. The Gardaí said they would prefer to speak with the caller again before approaching the two people mentioned, but they would if they had to. One of the persons mentioned by the caller had already been identified by the Gardaí as a possible suspect which would make them less wary to speak to someone on an anonymous tip, but they were still keeping an open mind. By late November 1989, Gardy put out another appeal for information on a young man who was seen on the corner of Ballyrone Road and Ballyrone Crescent, talking to a man driving a deep red or wine-coloured car with the registration with the letters ZU and 7, and the man had curly grey hair and clean-shaven. The Gardaí also revealed that there was a small number of suspects contained to the Ballyrone area. In November 1994, Gardaí issued a computer-generated photograph of Philip as he might look aged 21. The photograph is featured on Crimeline to see if they can generate new leads. They receive a letter from a woman who said on the day Philip disappeared, she saw three older boys followed by a younger boy on a bridge leading from Dodder Road to Bushy Park and that a number of people gathered around to witness an event. A separate report stated that Philip's disappearance could have been due to an accident on the bridge, which could have collapsed due to damage incurred during Hurricane Charlie the previous year. But this area was searched thoroughly and no body was recovered. In January 1995, it was reported that a North County businessman who wished to remain anonymous had offered a £20,000 reward for information into Philip's disappearance. The businessman was described as an acquaintance of Philip's mother, Alice. Other reports state the man was a lottery millionaire, but the Cairns family said they did not know the identity of this businessman. Eventually, this man would identify himself as James Connolly, who had recently won £256,000 on Spin the Wheel. Mr Connolly stated, that he met a witness who claims he saw Philip get into a parked car. He had been investigating Philip's disappearance for the past three years and believes he has information linking everything together and all he needs is the last piece. He appealed to friends of former classmates of Philip's. In July of the same year, Mr Connolly was involved in a car accident that took the life of his wife. In 2002, it is reported the £70,000 was put up as a reward by some wealthy businessmen. The offer came as it emerged private eyes had been secretly spying on high-ranking members of a suspected paedophile gang for two years. They believed the alleged perverts, who included a respected businessman, murdered Philip in 1986 and buried his body on a development site. The site was identified, but the land has since been built on. In this same article, it is said that Philip was killed after threatening to spill the beans about a paedophile gang who had lured him. Jimmy Guerin, brother to the journalist Veronica Guerin, 
also reported that Philip was about to reveal that he was being abused by a person well known to him, was abducted and murdered in an effort to protect the abuser. His body was subsequently dumped in a pond in the grounds of Loretta Abbey, Rathfarnham. It was further stated that since 1986, the layout of the Abbey grounds has changed due to development and at least two ponds there were filled in, excavated and developed. One of the ponds, the largest, is now a tennis and basketball court. The other large pond is where the retirement home was built and is still owned by the Order. The article by Jimmy Guerin also stated that these ponds were not searched as part of the original investigation. When the nuns at the Abbey were asked about the ponds, they stated that there were never any ponds on the site and even the Gardaí had been through the topography of the area and discounted Jimmy Guerin's claims. They said the entire Abbey site was searched when Philip disappeared. There were no ponds and nobody buried there. However, when Loretto Abbey was advertised for sale subsequently to Philip's disappearance, there was reference in the sale particulars to at least one pond on the site being sold. The existence of ponds on Loretto Abbey site in the past appeared to be well documented and indeed part of the site or land close to it was known as the ponds for this reason. There is also a black and white postcard available to purchase online of a large pond marked Loretto Abbey, Rathfarnham. In relation to the paedophile ring, the Guardies said there was no proof or evidence in relation to Philip being caught up in such a thing. Philip's parents were horrified by this story and said, quote, There is a memory of a young boy to be honoured and protected. As a family, we don't believe there was any ongoing abuse before Philip went missing. It's still a mystery as far as we are concerned. Alice, Philip's mother, also stated there was no change in his behaviour in the months prior to his disappearance. In October 2006, Gardaí report they are hoping DNA from Philip's bag may help identify his abductors. The school bag now described as Navy is held in a sealed container at Rathfarnham Garda Station and currently reveals a mix of DNA from different sources. It was hoped with advances in technology they would soon be able to narrow down to identify different people. One of these people was a phone call received by a male caller three years earlier, stating he and a friend had killed Philip. But when the call was traced to a flat in Dublin city, the man had fled to Northern Ireland and Gardaí were searching for him. But conflicting reports said that the flat was occupied by a couple with no connection to Philip's death, but rather the call came from a pub which could not be identified. In October 2007, a fresh appeal is put out on Crime Watch and the Irish Crime Stoppers Trust offers €10,000 for information. Following this appeal, two women came forward, claiming to have information about Philip's death. One woman, who was living with her then partner at the time, confessed to killing Philip and the second woman corroborated her evidence. The suspect was also a paedophile. He was described as being in his 60s and from Rathfarnham. The man was described as being first questioned after the 13-year-old went missing, but no evidence as to his guilt was then available. Two searches of the Grange Golf Course in Rathfarnham were done in 2009, but with no results. In 2011, forensic profiler states Philip may not have gone back to school that afternoon and died in a random act of sexual abuse or bullying. There were reports of a teenage bullying ring in the neighbourhood at that time. In 2016, it was reported that a woman had come forward with information indicating that a man named Eamon Cook may have been involved in Philip's death. It was stated that the woman, then nine years old herself in 1986, was in the car with Cook. It is not stated if Philip was in the car also. She said Cook knew Philip and had promised to take him to the radio station he owned. At the station, a row broke out when she was in another room and she believed that Cook struck Philip with an implement. She said she saw Philip bleeding and unconscious on the floor and that she then fainted herself. She said she then later woke up in the car driven by Cook but was unsure if Philip was in the car with them. 
The detective saw that her story was credible. So you may ask, who is Cook? Eamon Cook was founder and head of Radio Dublin. He had, over many years, committed serious paedophile offences against a number of children. One of these children was the woman who came forward in 2016. There is no doubt Cook was an evil and violent man. In 1957, he was sentenced to five years penal servitude after pleading guilty to shooting at four Gardaí. In 1986, he again was convicted of an arson attack on a former employee who had been dating his ex-girlfriend. Although described by newspaper reports at the time as a young girl with whom he had a love affair with, she was in fact a woman who had been sexually abused by Cook from childhood and had herself born a child to him. Any involvement of Cook in Philip's death begs two questions. The first relates to timing. On October 21st, 1986, two days before Philip's disappearance, Cook pleaded guilty to conspiracy to commit the arson attack. His sentence was adjourned to Monday, the 3rd of November. On October 22nd, the day before Philip went missing, four other men who acted with Cook in the arson attack received suspended sentences. It was not the most opportune time to carry out an abduction and murder, to put it mildly. Cook received a suspended sentence on the Monday from Judge Rowe. Anyone that has watched my video on Father Niall Malai will be familiar with this judge and so there's no surprise why Cook was freed. The second question was relating to the lack of any other known connection between Philip and Cook. Cook at the time was living at Radio Dublin's headquarters on Ichiko Road, having been brought up and lived all his life in the North City Centre. Although not a religious man, Cook associated with at least one paedophile with religious connections, Father Tony Walsh, a friend of Father Michael Cleary, who had a radio show on Radio Dublin in the late 70s and 80s. Philip was, according to his family and friends, a very religious boy, and it is possible, if he was being abused by a paedophile, that the paedophile was someone who also had religious interests. It is possible that someone may have taken Philip to Cook's studio, where he was injured as alleged. However, this does not necessarily indicate that Cook was responsible for Philip's disappearance, unless the sighting in the studio was the day of his disappearance or subsequently. It therefore becomes important to clearly date this sighting which the woman that came forward couldn't do as she was only nine at the time and also going through her own trauma. Cook would also be eventually found guilty for sexual abuse and sentenced to 10 years in prison. And when the woman came forward in 2016 with her story, the Garty interviewed Cook in a hospice where he was receiving palliative care since being released on humanitarian grounds. Cook corroborated some aspects of the statement given by the woman, but the media were not given the information on what exactly he admitted to. Was it merely the location of the studio in 1986 and other mediocre admissions, but no real information? Like, did he know Philip? Who killed him and where is his body? Remember, Cook at this stage was on his deathbed from cancer and probably drugged up to the eyeballs. Cook could have been working in tandem with Father Bill Carney, but Carney never served in Philip's parish. Both men are now dead and this report was never published until after Cook died. You see, conveniently, no prosecution can be brought against the dead, nor can they be defamed under Irish law. Attributing a murder on a dead person is one way to end an investigation without further inquiry, so I can see the reasons why this is the way it is. Plus, the dead can't defend themselves. Also, the DNA found on Philip's bag did not match Cook's. It is convenient to blame the death of Philip on two dead paedophiles and look no further. But even if Philip did die in Cook's studio, on or around the time in question, the question is who brought him there and for what? Cook liked girls and from reports, he was not that way inclined towards boys, but he had plenty of friends that were. Remember, this was the period of time where allegations that were to come to light were in this time period, swimming coaches and priests at the forefront. So is it so unbelievable for Philip to end up in the hands of these monsters? 
I know for the family it doesn't bear thinking about and I don't blame them. No one either is casting doubt on the work done by individual officers. The history of Philip's case, as reported, does however raise concern that their ability to solve it has been impeded, firstly by deficiency in the initial search and secondly by less than helpful leaks to the media. I find after doing this case, as others, it's exhausting. So much information given by good people meaning well, but none of it leading to what happened to Philip that day. I did work as a hairdresser in the 90s and Philip's Aunt Mary used to be a client of mine and I can tell you she was the sweetest lady you could meet. Her eyes would well up with tears at the mention of Philip. She didn't tell me for a long time who she was. As she explained, when she came in to get her hair done, it gave her a moment of normality to where she didn't have to talk about him as it was so difficult for her. I know a lot of people in Ireland are familiar with this case and it's one of the longest running unsolved missing persons case, but it doesn't make Philip any less important and any less loved. As one comment under one of my videos stated, unsolved, no story. And I would say to you, try telling that to the faces of the people who live every day not knowing where or what happened to their loved ones. I hope this never happens to you and for people to tell you the same thing. And if anybody knows anything about what happened to Philip, I would ask you to please, please come forward. We don't know how much time any of us have left and we would really like to be able to bring Philip home, give him a burial and somewhere for my mother to go where she knows where he is.